This is going to be the first video in a series of a couple of videos where I replace all the speakers in my home cinema setup with much better ones. And today we're going to be taking a look at my new subwoofer, which is the XLS 200 FF by BK Electronics. When I went out to get a subwoofer, I didn't realise the sheer amount of different options there are, and it was a total minefield. My main requirements were that I wanted something really good that would be good for music and sound like that that's very precise, rather than just being a big box that just rumbles. But I also wanted to spend under £400, ideally around the £300-£400 mark. And the tricky thing with it was that I needed something that could go quite low frequency, that could go down quite low. Because my current subwoofer is an old Tannoy EFX, it's not very good at all, but it does the job. It's the same as their SFX and TFX and various other names, and it's a pretty low-end sub. And it goes down to about 40 hertz. And that's fine for my current satellite speakers because they go only go down to 100 hertz. So the subwoofer can fill in 40 hertz to 100 hertz, and it does that okay, but it's not particularly good. We'll go into that later. But my new satellite speakers go down to 40 hertz. So there's no point in me getting a new sub at the bottoms out at 40 hertz because the front speakers could just do that. So I wanted something that could go down a lot lower in the frequency range. There's a few options out there. And before I discovered this, I was almost dead, dead set on the Bowers & Wilkins ASW608, which could go down to about 23Hz, and cost around £390. However, I was doing a bit of research into that, and I found a couple of forums where people mentioned this subwoofer. So I dug into it a little bit, and I think this could be one of the best value subwoofers on the market at the moment. This is the XLS200 from BK Electronics, as I mentioned. This is their Mark II. I don't know when it came out. The Mark II's been out quite a while anyway, but it's the Mark II version. And BK are quite a small company based in Essex, so they're a UK-based company, and they're all handmade in the UK. And when I saw that, I thought, this is going to be far too expensive to get a sort of handmade UK subwoofer. But no, it's £350. And I actually paid even less than this. I think I paid about £300 or something, because I bought it on eBay. Because At the time I bought it, they didn't have stock, so I bought it on eBay. But they've now got stock again, so you can now get it for £350 brand new. But unlike the other ones, that all go down to about 40 hertz, maybe 23 at a push. This goes down to 17 hertz, so this can go really low frequency, it's got a really good frequency range. So I thought, it's got, it's got good reviews, the specs seem perfect, the price seems decent, so let's get it and try it out. So here it is. So here we've got the subwoofer itself. First of all, we'll take a look at the accessories it comes with. So first of all, you get a standard IEC lead, although mine bizarrely came with this instead, which is like a filtered one. And we'll get onto this later, but the seller said it was like an optional extra, but we'll chat about this later. But it, normally it just comes as a standard IEC lead, but we'll talk about this in a minute. You also get a really long just RCA cable, so it's stereo RCA on one end, stereo RCA on the other. And it seems quite good quality, and I think it's about 5 metres or so long. And then finally you get this cable here, which is for the, the high level input that they call, they call it. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. But it's a speak on jack on one end, three bare wires on the other end, and then this is probably I think again about 5 metres long. Here we've got a subwoofer. This is the white one, so it's fully white with a, so it's a white body and a white fr front. But it's available in different colours, so you can get white, black, silver, and I think there's a couple of wood effects as well. And then this front is available in black or white. And in fact, because I got this second hand, the seller actually included a black one as well. So I guess he must have bought like it with one and then bought another colour later. And these are easily replaceable. So you can change the colour if you want, and the front just pops off. It's quite a nice mechanism, it's almost like a little ball catch type thing, so it's actually quite easy to get off, but also feels quite secure. That comes off there. And what I'm thinking I might actually do with this, even though it's not an official thing, is, I've, is I prefer the white one to the black one, but I'd much prefer a light grey colour. So what I might actually do is just unstaple the black material from this and then get some sort of acoustically transparent grey material and put it on instead. But anyway, I might do that in another video. But yep, that front comes off there. And that reveals the driver. So here's the driver. This is a 10 inch peerless XLS10 driver. And this is apparently quite a well regarded subwoofer and it feels really good quality. Especially as comparing it to my old one, just things like the solidity of all the sort of parts and like the rubber gasket around the outside just feels a lot more solid than my old one that was all a bit squishy and just felt a bit cheap. This seems like a really good quality driver. And because it's just an off the shelf peerless driver, you could replace this if you wanted to. Not that you would need to, and obviously if it broke you could probably get warranty service, there's a two year warranty on it. But you could actually just replace this yourself, it's just a standard part. And that's it there. And then this is driven by a 275 watt amplifier, so that's really powerful. My old one was only 100 watt. 
and then around the back you can see all the controls and the interface. So you've got the big metal backplate here with this giant heatsink on it for cooling the amplifier. This doesn't actually get too hot in use, although I don't push it that hard, but it just gets slightly warm, so there's no issue there at all. Boring stuff first, so down the bottom you've got an IEC connector here with a fuse carrier, so there is a fuse in that just in case it did blow, you might need to replace it down there. Latching power switch for the mains, that just isolates the mains. And then the LED, that's green if it's on or red if it's in standby mode, because it has one of those sort of standby modes where it detects an audio signal, and if there's no audio signal it goes into standby. And that's what that, and that's, that just indicates that there. Then just BK logo, address and all that sort of stuff. And it's nice getting something from a UK company rather than something that was made overseas, this was made locally. Or, you know, reasonably locally. And out up the top, we can see all the inputs and all the controls. Now, you've got two different types of input on this subwoofer. You've got this, which is called the high-level input, and this, which is called the low-level input. And BK really promote the fact that they've got these high-level inputs, and apparently it's a really good high-level input compared to other ones. Essentially, the difference is that with a low-level input, you feed a line-level signal, so a standard output of your, your media player, your PC, your phone, whatever device you're feed, feeding into this a standard line level output over an RCA cable goes into here. The high level input on the other hand is where you feed a speaker level input. So this is where you'd feed the output of an amplifier. So you'd have a signal going off your front speakers and then additionally you'd almost piggyback on the back of that and send that signal into here. And that's what you use the speak on cable for. That speak on connector which is nice quality goes in there, clicks round and that holds it really securely. Then you can pull it back and unlock it. It's interesting seeing that because a lot of subwoofers, some do have high level inputs but they're usually just cheap binding posts or things you stick wires into. It's nice seeing an actual speak on connector. This is a bit of a, this isn't the best speak on, of it. it's not a new trick one, I think it's just a cheaper generic one but it works fine. But then what you do is you put your speak on connector in there and you connect these wires off to your speaker. The actual, the actual wiring, like the colour coding is detailed in the manual but one of these I think the black goes to ground and then one's your left speaker and one's your right speaker and you connect these in to the connections from your amplifier that go off your front speakers. What you then do is you can then set a crossover frequency and that's done using this here, we'll talk about this later. And you can see you set a crossover frequency that sets what frequencies should be sent, should be replicated by the subwoofer. So if your front speakers can go down to about 40 hertz, you set the crossover to 40 hertz and anything below 40 hertz will be played by the subwoofer. One thing I will quickly say is look up the manual before you connect this up because I've seen stuff around if you've got a class D amplifier, like a digital amplifier you, they can, you're you apparently meant to connect up a bit weirdly like you're not meant to connect the ground or something there's something weird like that where if you've got a, re a regular class A, B amplifier you just connect it normally so definitely check the manual before you do this but what they claim doing this and it sounds a bit audiophile but it does kind of make sense is that by using a high level input any colouring that your amplifier does to the sound will also be replicated on the subwoofer. So if your ampl amplifier changes the sound in a slight way or just has any tainting of the sound, the subwoofer will also replicate that. Whereas if you're feeding this a line level input from your source, this, the, cut, the sort of sound of this might not technically potentially match the sound of your amplifier. You know, any effect your amplifier has in the sound won't come through onto this. So it does somewhat make sense. But there's a bit of a caveat I'll get onto in a second as to why I'm not personally using this. But I might give it a go later and see do I actually notice the difference. You've then got your regular line level inputs or low level inputs as they call them. And you can either connect both these up for left and right stereo or if you've got an AV receiver like I do, you just connect a single RCA cable from your subwoofer output into just the right jack because it's label mono and that'll work fine. You've then got all these various controls for all the inputs. So the first thing you'll see is there's a gain that's separate for the high level input and the low level input. So you can actually set the levels of these independently. And that's because if you're using the high level input, you might also want to use the low level one. For example, if you're using an AV receiver to watch movies, lots of movies have a, what's called a low frequency effects or LFE soundtrack in it, which is a soundtrack that's designed for subwoofers. It's basically sounds that have to go to the subwoofer generally sort of sounds like explosions or things that are meant to shake the room. And with an AV receiver, you would still want to connect the low level input up to your subwoofer, just for that, up to your subwoofer and receiver, just for that LFE track. But then you might have the sound from your front speakers going into high level input. So this means you can adjust how loud the sound from your front speaker should be 
versus the low frequency effects. And that's why they're controlled separately. Next up over here, you've got this frequency control, which is what they call the crossover. And this is essentially a low pass filter that defines what frequency should be replicated by the subwoofer. So this goes between 40 hertz and 120 hertz. So what you would do with this is if you've not got an AV receiver with a built-in crossover, or you're using the high level input, you set what frequencies, a point that the frequency was below that, the point you set, should be played by the subwoofer. So for example, if you've got front speakers that can go down to 60 hertz, you then want to set this round about 60-ish hertz, it doesn't really say, but just sort of like, you know, just above 40 kind of thing. And then any frequencies below 60 hertz will be played by the subwoofer, and anything else will be set to your front, sent to your front speakers. And that's what you'd use there. Or if you just want the subwoofer to play everything that's sent to it, because I'm using an AV receiver, you can just turn it up to the maximum there. Next up, you've got a phase control, which goes between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. And this is a bit of a concept I kind of understand, but not I've never really used it. And essentially, it adds a slight delay to the sound. If speakers are in phase, or 0 degrees, it essentially means that the drivers on all the speakers should be moving out at the same time, or pulling back in at the same time. At 180 degrees, you've done what's called invert the phase. So when the speakers are pu pushing the drivers out, this one being 180 degrees out of phase will be pulling its driver in, and vice versa. So when this one pushes its driver out, the other speakers will be pulling the drivers back in. This seems to be a sort of thing if you've got different positioning of the subwoofer, for example. If you've got the subwoofer behind you, you may want to then set this to a different frequency from if it's in front of you, a different phase from if it's in front of you. But it's the sort of thing you really just need to play about with and test. And generally, you can leave it on zero degrees. But what is quite cool with this is this is actually variable. You can vary it, vary it between 0 and 180 degrees. Whereas lots of other subs, including my old one, it's just a switch between 0 and 180. So this does give you more control, but I just tend to leave it on 0 degrees. I've never found any benefit to not using that. And I do have it sitting in front of me where you'd normally just want to leave it on 0 degrees. The final control you've got is this one labelled filter, which looks like a knob, but it's actually just a switch that goes between in and out LFE. I've already mentioned this crossover here, and what this basically means is this filter adjustment, this switch, applies only to the low level input. When it's set to the in position, this crossover here will apply to both the high level input and the low level input. When it's set to out LFE, the crossover here will only apply to the high level input. The low level input will play anything you send it. So for example, if you set this down to 40 hertz and have this in the in position, any signals below below 40 hertz, above 40 hertz, whether they're coming into the low level input or the high level input, will not be played. On the other hand, if you set this to out LFE, and again have this set to 40 hertz, if a 60 hertz signal comes in to the low level input, it will still play it because it's set out. But if a 60 hertz signal comes into the high level input, it won't be played. And this is from that scenario earlier, where you might have the high level input connected to your front speakers at which point you'd want to set the crossover so that frequencies sent to your front speakers are not sent to the subwoofer, but where you also have a connection to your AV receiver over a low level input for low frequency effects. Because even if you've got this set to 40 hertz to put a crossover on your front speakers, you still want all the low frequency effects to be played through this. So that's what that switch does there. However, there's one caveat to using the high level input that I think is worth mentioning, because it's something I hadn't really thought of before I bought this and went to set it up. With the high level input, you can set the crossover here, so you can set it to set a low pass filter to limit what frequencies can go to, can be played by the subwoofer. But obviously there's no way to stop frequencies being played by your front speakers, unless your front speakers just aren't capable of playing them. So as an example, the new front speakers I'm going for here can go down to 40 hertz at the lowest frequency. So I could use a high level input with those, I set this frequency adjustment here down to 40 hertz, connect the high level input up to my front speakers, anything above 40 hertz will be played by my front speakers, and anything below 40 hertz will be played by the subwoofer. However, I've done a bit of testing. I connected just the low level input up to my AV receiver and used the crossover built into my receiver. And that crossover can actually limit not only what goes to the subwoofer, but also what goes to the front speakers. And through testing, I found that I preferred the sound if I set the crossover point to 60 hertz, meaning that anything below 60 hertz gets sent to the subwoofer, and anything above 60 hertz gets sent to the front speakers. And I think that's because what it does 
is it means my front speakers aren't doing as much work. They're not busy trying to reproduce a lot of bass, so they can focus a bit more on the mids and the highs, and then that offloads much more bass to the subwoofer. And I found that I much preferred that sound, it made the mids a lot clearer. But in order to do that, I have to stop my front speakers playing sounds below 60 Hz. And that's just not possible using this high level input, without using some sort of external crossover I'd have to buy. So that's worth bearing in mind. The high level input is probably worth using if you're happy having your front speakers go down to their lowest frequency and have the subwoofer doing anything below that point. However, if you want to limit what frequencies are reproduced by your front speakers, and then send frequencies below that to the sub, you can't really use the high level input for that. You'd have to just use a low level input into your AV receiver. And that's what I'm doing for this. On the bottom of the sub, you've got these four spikes. Now, if you want to have a bit of a laugh at audiophile nonsense, just try and do a bit of research to work out what these spikes are meant to do to the sound quality, because there's simultaneous people saying it couples, to the, couples it to the floor, other people saying it decouples it from the floor, other people saying it has no effect at all, and you can buy gold-plated spikes because somehow gold is required to make something stand on the floor nowadays. But anyway, audiophile nonsense. But yeah, you've got these spikes on the bottom, or it also came with these which are like plastic, just flat feet you could use instead. I've got the spikes in because it pokes through the carpet and I feel it makes it a lot more stable, otherwise it kind of rests on top of the carpet. And looking it up online, the most sane people that seem to be talking vague sense seem to be just be saying they poke through the carpet forcing it to stick on the under, sit on the underfloor, and it makes it sit a little bit more stable rather than rocking around. So that's why I've got them in. The only thing I would say with these spikes is they are extremely sharp. So be careful. You'll notice throughout this I've had it sitting on a bit of wood, rather than, like a bit of scrap wood rather than on my table, and that's because these are so sharp that they're actually, even that bit of laminate wood they're sitting on, they're actually poking holes through it, or at least damaging the surface. So if you've got, for example, a hardwood floor, I wouldn't use these spikes or I would put them on but then lay it on the floor and do not slide it. And if you've got kids or someone who's, who's potentially going to go and slide the subwoofer around, I wouldn't use the spikes because these would really badly scratch the floor. So they're fine for me because they poke through the carpet and make it sit really solidly, but I would just be very careful. Otherwise you could just use the included plastic things or these use a standard 8mm screw thread. So you could just replace these. There's lots of other options out there for mounting these sorts of subwoofers including some ridiculously overpriced audiophile things, but yeah, you can get different replacements for these. So this is what it comes with, but yeah, if you've got a really expensive hardwood floor, I'd be very careful with these spikes, but on carpet they work fine. And they are adjustable. You can sort of screw the spike in or out of the sub, and then there's this nut on it that you can use, so you can loosen it off, screw it in like that, and that lets it sit further out. And it's just a bit of a fiddle to try and get them balanced so they're, it sits level. And now I'm not going to actually mark that up. There we go. So that sits there. So, yep, yeah, you've got these spikes on the bottom. Don't know what they do to the sound quality. Can't find anyone giving any sort of straight answer. But they seem to make it sit a lot more stable on my carpeted floor. Just be very careful on hardwood floors, because these will really badly scratch it. As I mentioned previously, this is the XLS 200 FF. And there's also the XLS 200 DF. And the FF is the front firing subwoofer with the driver on the front. The DF is a down firing subwoofer with the driver on the bottom and the front is just solid, just solid the same colour as everything else. Now there's two different uses for those different subs. Generally speaking, from what I can find, a forward firing subwoofer like this one here is a bit more accurate, it'll produce music a little bit better, it'll be a bit more precise. However, a down firing subwoofer is designed to shake the floor a lot more. So if you're wanting something that's a bit more room shaking and a bit more, ex you're a bit better for like explosions and stuff like that, you might want a down firing sub. But for me, my focus with this is to get one that's going to be good for reproducing music and be really good quality and be a lot more precise, which is why I went for a forward firing one. You'll also notice with this subwoofer that there's no bass port on it. There's no ports in the side, front, back, any way that air from the inside can get to the outside, really. It's a fully sealed enclosure. And this is something you'll find with subwoofers. There's two different types. There's portes enclosures and there's sealed enclosures. Ported enclosures are the ones that have those big base ports somewhere on them. And the idea with that is it lets air inside the subwoofer come to outside and vice versa as the cone moves. So as the driver's moving in and out, the air pressure inside can equalise through the port. And generally speaking, they can be a bit louder for the same level of amplifier power. However, they're not necessarily as accurate or as precise. So if you want something that's really loud and powerful and shakes the room, a ported enclosure might be a bit better. But if you want something that's a bit more precise, a bit more responsive, 
a sealed enclosure like this might be better because air can't escape from the inside so it does mean the driver's working against the air pressure a bit so it, does, it isn't going to be as loud as one with a port but what it does mean is it, it generally means this, the driver's a lot more responsive, it'll snap back quicker it'll just be a bit quicker to change to change frequency it'll stop dead, it won't sort of have momentum and rumble it just, it just sounds a bit more precise how much of a deal that is I don't really know but it does seem that any seal subwoofer I've heard has sounded a little bit better in terms of just musical performance and precision than a porty subwoofer but they generally serve two different purposes so it's just worth bearing in mind if you're shopping for a subwoofer pay attention to whether you're getting a sealed one or a ported one because they kind of serve different use cases so now I'll go and set it up and I'll come back with my feedback and for this testing I'm deliberately using my old satellite speakers and I'll be doing the new satellite speakers in the next video the reason I'm doing that is because my current satellite speakers, the Mordent Shore MS302s can only go down to about 100Hz, 120Hz they don't go down that low and that means that the subwoofer does a lot more of the work so I'll be able to hear the subwoofer a lot more with the new speakers the subwoofer will be a bit less important because it won't be handling as much of the frequency range so I thought I'll try it out with my old speakers and see how big the difference is because I definitely noticed with the old subwoofer the bass just, or the lower frequency below 100Hz just don't sound that great so I'm really excited to see what this will sound like okay so I've now got the sub set up and all I can say is wow what a difference why didn't I do this before and it's also making me even think why am I even going to bother replacing my satellite speakers because the difference this has made is huge although the new satellite speakers will also be a lot better but the difference this sub has made is massive the first thing I noticed is just how much more precise it is it just sounds a lot more responsive it just seems like it's reacting to changes in the music a lot quicker or if there's a complex bass line with lots of different notes all at the same time it can do that whereas the old sub kind of just merged everything into one and just produced generic bass sound it just you could hear different frequencies there but they were all a bit muddled together whereas this all the individual notes are all really distinctly separated and you can clearly hear them so it just sounds so much more accurate and so much more precise and I've been listening to music I've just heard stuff that I've not heard before songs I've heard hundreds of times that I've played on this and I've just realised how much more just how much more bass and how much better sounding the bass was than what I've ever heard before across any of my other speakers and that's just thinking of this going down to 40 hertz when you take into account that this goes down as low as 17 hertz which is below the range of human hearing you just hear all this extra bass below that 40 hertz mark that I'd never really thought of before I'd always just assumed oh 40 hertz that's like the cut off you know there's not going to be much below that on any sort of modern music but there is there's so much so many tracks that I've listened to where I've just realised how there's so much stuff there that I've just never heard before because my old system didn't go down as low frequency and while a lot of the time my reaction's just been oh that sounds a bit better there's been times I've been sitting just working or relaxing on the couch with music on the background and not really been focusing on it and a new track comes on or like a drop hits or something and I've actually like looked over and gone wait what because it's taken, my, it actually caught my attention how much lower it goes or how much more bass or how better the bass sounds it's actually really impressive and I wish I'd got this sooner because the difference is huge now there was one interesting thing I found with this and it's to do with this fancy filtered mains cable it came with that they said was an optional extra when I first set this sub up I just used the existing IEC cable that was already feeding the old one purely because I'm lazy and couldn't be bothered digging it out the back and re re a new one and it worked absolutely perfectly but I noticed that there was a very slight hum from the sub and when I say this it was n it's in no way problematic or like n didn't bother me at all if I sat literally next to the subwoofer like you know here and put my ear up to it I could hear a faint hum in the background and if I was sitting on the couch it was basically inaudible in fact the noise of my fridge coming through the wall from the kitchen was actually louder than any sort of hum this was producing so it's not problematic at all but I thought for a laugh I'll put this cable in and just see if it makes a difference and it actually did, it totally cleared it up there was absolutely no hum when I used this cable so I popped this open to see what's inside I've already taken the screws out so it just comes open there obviously there's normally screws in there so it doesn't come apart that easily and it's all hot glued in looks very sort of homemade so I think this is made by BK and there's a pair of capacitors and then four diodes on the back now it's all hot glued in I don't want to break it because it, you know, it does actually make a difference but looking up circuits online this looks like some sort of DC blocker circuit where you've got some sort of bridge rectifier thing on the back here a couple of capacitors it looks like something that would block 
that would allow AC to pass through and block any DC. And I suspect that's what this is doing. Now, BK don't seem to sell this on their website, but I looked up some forums basically looking at this sub and looking at people talking about the slight hum it has. And quite a lot of people were saying, or at least a few I saw, said that they contacted BK to report that as a problem and they were sent this as a solution and that it fixed it. So what I'm wondering is if there's just maybe not quite enough filtering or something in it that causes that hum. And it maybe just depends on your environment. If you've got a lot of noisy equipment in place, it might be a more pronounced noise, in which case something like this would be more important. Whereas here, because I've not got as much running, it's maybe not as big a deal, and then, which is why the hum is quite low for me. But yeah, the hum for me wasn't a problem at all. You know, it was something I noticed and I tried this just because I had it and it did fix it. If I hadn't had this cable, I would have totally been totally okay with the hum. I would have just lived with it because it's in no way too loud. If I sit on the couch or even quite close to the sub, it's inaudible. But I just did find it quite interesting that this was included and that people have mentioned receiving these from BK if they've experienced a humming problem. So it's just worth bearing in mind that if you do find have this and it does hum, but maybe it hums louder than mine for some reason, it is actually a problem, it's worth contacting BK because he might send you something like this that would potentially fix it. And yeah, it's quite interesting, but yeah, as far as I can tell, it's a dead simple just DC blocker type circuit. It's nothing fancy at all. And you can obviously buy these aftermarket as well, but obviously they tend to be audiophile, I'm doing air quotes, audiophile things, which tend to cost hundreds of pounds for not much. So if you can get them to send you one for free or find a generic equivalent of this, that's probably a better option. But yeah, yes, there is a slight hum to it in the background based on my environment. And that's also without, without the signal cable connected. So it's not like it's coming from any other equipment. There is a slight hum, but for me, it wasn't a problem. You had to literally sit right next to it and listen for it to hear it. It's no worse than I've heard from many other subwoofers before. So I'm now going to try and do some proper scientific tests to compare these two subwoofers. Admittedly, in a very unscientific way without the correct equipment, but I'll try it anyway. The software I'm going to use is free software called REW, which is fairly decent free software that will play test tones through speakers, receive the, record the output through a microphone, and then analyze it and let you view things such as the frequency response. Now for this, I'm going to need a microphone. You can, of course, buy expensive calibration microphones, but the problem with them is they're expensive and I don't do much audio stuff, so it'd be a bit of a waste of money me spending 50, 60 odd pounds on a microphone and then using it once for this video. But what I do have is this microphone, which is the calibration microphone that came with my Denon AV receiver. And while I thought at first, that's a stupid idea, this isn't going to work, I found a forum thread online that I'll try and link in if I remember and if I can find it again. But it was someone who compared these Odyssey calibration microphones to a couple of well-known reputable calibration microphones. And they tested quite a lot of them together and graphed the frequency response. And to be honest, this was very com pretty much comparable to all of them. In the very high frequencies, this did drop off a little bit, but I'm testing low frequencies here. And between like the, you know, 100 hertz to 20 hertz mark, this basically was exactly in line and followed the exact same res result as all the other calibration microphones they tried. So I'm relatively confident that this will actually do a reasonably good job of measuring these subwoofers. And I suppose it has to because that's what the AV receiver is doing. So yeah, that's the microphone I'll be using there. Now, obviously this then terminates into a 3.5 mil jack and this requires plug-in power. So it needs a, a, microphone in, a microphone input that can provide plug-in power. Now, because basically all modern laptops don't have dedicated microphone inputs, I don't have a splitter to split that out. So what I'm gonna be using is my Zoom H2N audio recorder, which I won't be able to obviously film when I'm doing it because this is actually, as you can see, it's currently recording me. So I'll use this separately. But this can act as a USB audio interface. So instead of my microphone that's plugged in here, I'll plug this microphone in, connect this to my laptop over USB, and this will basically turn this Odyssey microphone into a USB microphone that the software can use. Then all I need to do is connect an audio output from the laptop to the speaker. So what I'll do is I'll just use a standard RCA 3.5mm cable into the sound card on the laptop. And that'll allow the laptop to play tones through the speakers, receive the result through the microphone, and analyse the output. So hopefully that'll work pretty well. There's also facilities, for example, where, you can, where you're meant to connect the output of the laptop into your audio interface, which I'll be doing here, and run some tests. And what that'll do is it'll let you cal it'll almost calibrate the characteristics of the output sound card as well as the input audio interface and it allows it to sort of cancel that out from the results that are picked up through the microphone. So I'll do that first and I'll run some tests 
and see what results we get. Now what I would say with these results when I do get them is treat them as a comparison between these two subwoofers. Don't treat them as like a comparison between this subwoofer and professional results for another subwoofer. Because I'm not in some sort of soundproof lab environment, nor do I have proper equipment. So the room acoustics will be having a bit of a say in this, as well as potentially just the equipment I'm using. So I'd like to think this will be good enough to compare the two of them because I'm using the same equipment in the same room. But I wouldn't be comparing the results that I get here to lab results for a different speaker if that makes sense. But it'll be good to compare them. So it's time to go and get these tested. I'll be back. Okay, so I've got the whole setup ready. You'll have to forgive the audio quality because I'm having to use a microphone built into my camera because my audio recorder is kind of being used right now. But I've got the Odyssey microphone here. That goes into the audio recorder, which then goes into the laptop over as a USB audio interface. Then the output of the laptop sound card goes into the subwoofer. I'll connect that to each subwoofer in turn and run the tests. I've already calibrated all the sound cards by basically putting a 3.5mm cable from the laptop into the audio recorder and running the calibration. So I'm running it off of a calibrated result. And what we'll now do is we'll try and do the test. So what we'll do is first of all we'll check levels. This will just check all levels are suitable. So I just played a sort of rumbly sound through the sub, just to, a sort of white noise type thing, just to check the levels are okay. I'm running this at a slightly low level, just because when I tried it at a very high level, or high volume, it made things in the room vibrated and I wasn't sure if that would potentially impact the sub. So I'm running it a bit quieter just because I want to not have things in the room rattle, like even my lights were rattling. Just to keep the room a bit quieter just to, so we're only measuring the sub. That's done. So I'm now going to run a sweep of four tests and we're going to go from 0 hertz to up to 250 hertz for good measure. Or I'll do 300 hertz. That's probably above what the sub will do, but I may as well test it absolutely full range. So what we'll now do is we'll hit start measuring and see what we get. And there we go, we've now got a result. So what I'll do is I'll save this result as the BK, and then I'll swap over the power and the audio input into the Tannoy subwoofer, and we'll run the exact same test again. Okay, so now connected the Tannoy subwoofer up. The microphone's basically sitting equidistant between the two of them, so I don't need to remove that. And I've already tested the levels, and they're coming out about the same, so I've adjusted the volume slightly, just so both subs are producing the same measured volume. And now let's run the test on the Tannoy subwoofer. So there we go, that's both subwoofers tested. Now we're going to take a look at the results. Now one thing I did find there, that might not have come across on camera because the camera's microphone isn't very good, but even just that frequency speak, uh, sweep test there, the BK sounded significantly better than the Tannoy. With the BK, you could hear the frequency sweep as a continuous sweep, and yeah, there was slightly quieter bits and slightly louder bits through the frequency range, but it was all at least one frequency sweeping the whole time. With the tannoy at different frequencies there was almost resonance and you could hear the case rattling and stuff at certain frequencies and that was at a lower volume. At a higher volume this sub just rattles like mad, it almost shakes itself apart. So it's interesting just even hearing in that test there that the BK sounded significantly better than the tannoy. But now we can go and compare the results. Okay, so here we've got the results. Now here we've got the tannoy in red and then we've got the BK in green. And we've got the frequency response from 15 hertz all the way up to 300 hertz. So we can overlay these two frequency responses and we can see what we get. Now, I'm not an expert in this, so I know the basics, but I don't know absolutely everything. So forgive me if I say anything a bit wrong here. But here we can see the frequency response. And we can see that the BK in green 
does generally have a much flatter frequency response across the range. With the Tano, you can see that it does drop that as soon as it gets to about 40 hertz, it just ends, or 50, 45 hertz ish, it totally drops off. The BK does drop a little bit, but not quite as badly. And it does, you know, it has dropped quite a bit at this point, but I don't know how much that could be room acoustics or the microphone. But we can see if we go along here, once the BK gets outside of its 17 hertz point, it then drops off a cliff. So the BK does definitely go down much lower than the Tannoy, even though it has dropped a little bit here. This could be many things. It could be the microphone, it could be the room. But we can see it does definitely go lower than the Tannoy. Across the range, you know, it goes up and down a little bit, but... Oh, zooming in out. Ah, how's the software work? Very confusing. Uh, there we go. As we see across the rest of the range, they're generally roughly in line, so even though they do go up and down a bit, they kind of follow each other. So that's indicating that it's not just one of the subwoofers got is going up and down, it's probably more due to room acoustics or the microphone. But we can see that they sort of they're reasonably similar around about this point, where like it's you know 100 hertz down to sort of 60 hertz, they follow each other quite a bit. But then once you get to especially about 140 hertz, you've passed the top end of the tannoy and it totally drops off a cliff. Whereas the BK, it keeps going, it goes all the way up 300 hertz and could probably go even higher. The main difference here though is when you look at the distortion. So here we've got a figure for THD, which is total harmonic distortion. We can plot on different harmonics of each speaker, so we can see the sort of levels of each harmonic frequency together. But if we just look at the fundamental frequency, and I've got this all normalised, this is this is the the harmonic distortion. Essentially, it's how many harmonic frequencies you're getting at the same time. It's where like it sort of act, plays harmonic frequencies in addition to the frequency it should be playing. I'll probably explain this really badly. But one, I was looking at different figures online, and what I was generally seeing is around about a harmonic of under ten percent. A THD of under ten percent is generally seen as acceptable for a subwoofer. Not for other things, but for a subwoofer, around about 10% seems to be a sort of reasonable idea. Now, if you look at the BK here, and as we go along the frequency, we're looking down the bottom here at the THD value. It's, you know, 1.2%, 0.6, 0.5, 0.4, drops all the way down to 0.1 at this point, and it goes up, and I think the highest you get is 1.6. So that's way within that 10% threshold, which is a bit of an arbitrary th threshold, but it's what I found online that seemed to make sense. And then you can see all the way up, it stays basically under 1.5% really. And then it stops at 150 hertz, it didn't seem to go all the way for some reason. But now let's look, take a look at the Tannoy. Now looking at the Tannoy, you don't see a huge difference there, but you can see the whole line is jumping up quite a bit. And if we go along this graph, you can see we're now yeah, 1%. We're below the Tannoy's frequency range anyway, but now we're consistently above 1%, 2, 3, and if we go up the highest, we're all the way up to 11%. So the harmonic distortion of this is a lot higher. Now, again, I'm not an expert in this. I don't know this stuff inside out. I'm just purely going based on some results I've got here and a little bit of research I've done online in probably about half an hour of research. But as you can see, the total harmonic distortion of the Tannoy is significantly higher than the BK. And this does kind of line up with what I was thinking when I was listening to them, where the BK sounded a lot more accurate and seemed to just produce individual frequencies much better, where the Tannoy was clearly producing harmonics and it was not sounding quite as clean, and when it was playing one frequency it was also getting others in there as well. So yeah, this does kind of show a little bit about why the BK does seem to sound better. And as you can see, when you look at the frequency response, you can definitely see that the BK does go a lot lower and also a lot higher. But yeah, that was some attempt at sort of a test there. I'm not an absolute expert at this. I don't really necessarily know what I'm doing, but I thought I'd play about with some software and take a look at this. So there's the results. Now, while it would be quite nice to provide an audio sample and actually do a recording, I did actually do that, but I'm currently editing the video, and to be honest, I can't tell the difference in the audio recording. The problem with testing a subwoofer is because it's such low frequencies, Microphones don't pick them up that easily and the room has a huge effect. It's just not particularly easy to show that on camera. It's a lot easier to show the difference between full range speakers just because there's more frequencies there. And chances are what you're listening on can reproduce the same frequencies as those speakers. But with the subwoofer, it just wasn't good enough. So I can't really easily show the audio difference as an audio sample.
but this does show a little bit about the difference and obviously I've verbalized how they sound as well. So yeah, not sure exactly how accurate these results are, but it's been quite interesting to play about with this software. So there you go, that's a look at my new subwoofer, which is the XLS200-FF from BK Electronics. And this thing sounds brilliant. I was expecting it to sound a lot better than my old one, but I didn't expect the difference to be that clear or that noticeable, but it really is. And having that additional frequency range all the way down to 17 hertz does make a huge difference. And the fact that this costs only about £350, comparing that to a lot of other subs in that price bracket, this thing seems like an excellent value. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, and if you're interested in buying this, I'll put links in the description.